Before we continue to examples, I'd like to prove a special case of Green's theorem. Remember, Green's theorem tells us that if D is a very nice region, so if D is a Jordan region, so I'll just remind us of what the theorem says here, and F is a vector field, so on this region, this is all in two-dimensional space, right? So if F equals PQ is a, is a vector field such that uh, the first partials, right, so D, let me just write uh, the words here, so such that the first partials are continuous on D, then um, we get a really nice theorem. So this is a lot of writing, but here's here's the uh, point here. What we end up with is that the, re the double integral over the region D of the function that is built by taking the difference of these partial derivatives, dx, dq dx minus dp dy, integrated with respect to area. This is equal to the path integral around the boundary. So of f dot dr, where c here is the boundary of d. And sometimes this c is actually written as partial d to show that it's a boundary. And uh, in particular, we can write out, because we know the components of this, we can write out this path integral as the integral along the boundary. We'll stick with that notation of dp dx uh, plus d plus q dy, right? Just by working out the dot product here in component form of, of this vector field. <clears throat> okay, we would like to prove this theorem for at least a special case. Um, the special case is going to be the following. So let's assume, for the sake of this video only, uh, Green's theorem holds for actually much more general regions than we've even stated, but let's assume that D is what our textbook calls a simple, a simple region. Okay, now simple has a couple of different technical definitions already, and the book is adding another one. So I'm just going to say that this is a special case. But just in case you're, you're following along with the textbook as well, D is simple. So what does this mean? Well, it means that D could be represented or can be represented or thought of as either a type 1 or a type 2 region. Or you could say as both a type 1 and a type 2 region. Um, so it can be represented by both uh, the type 1 and the type 2 perspectives. So remember what this means. Type 1 regions are bounded in the following way. So a type 1 region, a type 1 region is a region which is bounded in the x direction by vertical lines, but then in the y direction by functions, right? So this is bounded between, say, x equals a and x equals b, so vertical lines. But then these two boundaries are, let's say, g1 of x, so y equals g1 of x, and y equals g2 of x. So that's a type 1 region. A type 2 region is just the same picture flipped on its side, right? So a type 2 region um, is going to be a region that is bounded in the y direction by straight lines. So maybe it looks like this, like y equals d, y equals c. Pretend that that's a horizontal line, right? And then in this direction, it's bounded by, whoops, not like that, because it's got to be bounded by functions, right? So by functions, and this might be, let's say, h1 of y and h2 of y. Okay, and so the idea is that with these two types of regions, we can integrate the direction in the direction of the function boundaries first, parallel to the uh, straight line boundaries, and then just integrate up over an interval after we're done. And so if our, if our region D is assumed to be both of these, so it could be thought of as both of these types, then you can already imagine that this is going to be um, a to use the book's word, a simple region, right? It's going to be, it won't be too too exotic looking. But that's okay. So uh, we just want to be able to verify this by mathematical proof for at least a special case before we get into the examples. And then we will get into a lot of examples uh, throughout the rest of these notes. So um, let's start by making an observation. If we were to, say, zero out one of these two components. So let's just think of, the, say, the projection of the vector field onto one of the, the component directions and just zero out the other component direction. It's not a true projection, but let's just think of it that way, where we just zero out, say, the Q direction. Then what's going to happen? Well, if Q is zero, 
then dq dx is also zero. And what we must show then is that a integral over here that only involves p equals an integral over here that only involves p. And the same thing will be true if we zero out p, we can just look at q. So we can isolate the two components, okay? And so in Green's theorem, we're going to reduce it, in other words, right? We're going to make it easier. So Green's theorem uh, can be proved. So Green's theorem can be proved if we can show these two separate identities. So number one, that the double integral over d of minus dp dy with respect to a, this should be equal to the path integral around the boundary of p dx. Okay, I got this one by zeroing out the q in the vector field, and that of course zeroes this out, but it leaves this minus, so that's where the minus comes from. And we have to also show, this is not enough, right, because this ignores q, we have to also show that the integral over d over the region d of dq dx with respect to a that this should be equal to the path integral of q dy so that's the inner the second half of the path integral over here dq dy that's what happens if you zero out the p component okay so what i'm going to do in this lecture is i'm going to prove this first version Okay, or at least give an argument that proves this version, and leave the second half to you. Now, that becomes an exercise, okay? That becomes an exercise, but in the exercise, I want you to assume that the region is one of these very nice, simple regions, just as the textbook has. Okay, so let's do it. I'll put a little divider here. So let's suppose, for the sake of this first one, that we that our region D is a type 1 region. Okay, so we're going to prove, so I'll call this a partial proof. So we're going to try to prove that the double integral over D of negative DP DY with respect to area, that this equals the path integral PDX. Okay, so this is to be proved. That's not a claim, that is what we want to prove. That is the desired result, right? And so to do this, let's suppose that D is type 1. All right, if it's type 1, then it fits the picture that I've drawn up here. So this picture right here, type 1 means that it's bounded in the y direction by these two functions, G. Uh, g1 and g2, and in the x direction just by constants. And so that means that our d can be represented, again, in the x direction. Uh, let's write the y direction first because the functions matter, right? We're going to have to integrate this way. So it's going to go from g1 of x out to g2 of x. And then once we've done that, then we can integrate from a to b. Okay, and I'm saying integrate because I'm already thinking of this left-hand integral. So therefore, what do we have? Well, this double integral over d of minus dp dy dA in this type 1 sense, right, this can be then written as an iterated integral where the outer bounds are a and b, the inner bounds are this function with respect to y, so g1 to g2, okay, and then the integrand is dp dy, we're integrating in the y direction first, right, in the y direction first. And so, when we look at this, we see that the inner integral, we're going to do this as an iterated integral, this inner integral is a fundamental theorem of calculus, actually, because the bounds here are with respect to y, right? The, the pdx is now, um, sorry, dp dy, right, is a y derivative of a y integral. And so this whole thing, let's just write it a little bit differently so that we can really see how the fundamental theorem is working here. I'll leave the brackets in green. This minus sign can come out. The integrals from g1 of x to g2 of x, these are the bounds on the y, on the y value, right? And then we have the thing we're integrating up is the y derivative of this function, p of xy dy, okay? But the y integral treats all the x's like constants. And so what we end up with then is, of course, this all cancels out. We plug in these boundaries for y, right? And so this integral gets computed as the negative, so it's a, b, the negative of uh, p of x comma g2 of x minus p of 
x comma g1 of x, that's just fundamental theorem, dx, but then we can use this minus sign to switch the order, right? So this becomes integral from a to b of p x g1 of x minus p of x g2 of x um, dx. And if we wish, we can, of course, distribute through and just write this as a difference of two integrals. So this is the integral from a to b, p of x, g1 of x, dx, minus the integral a to b, p of x, g2 of x, dx. Okay, so this is the left-hand side of our uh, what we are hoping to prove for Green's theorem. If we're gonna show that these are equal, the next step, so this right here is the left-hand side. I'll color code it, right? The next thing we wanna do is show that the right-hand side holds. So this is the path integral of P around the boundary. Okay, so let's uh, try to write this integral out. I'm having trouble with my scrolling. So I'm gonna draw another kind of dividing line just to keep it straight. But the next integral that we wanna compute is what is the right-hand side of our statement, okay? But that's the path integral. So on the other hand, we have this path integral. Remember, we're just hoping to show that these are true, right? So on the other hand, our integral around the boundary of f dotted with dr, it's not the whole thing though, I'm sorry. It's just p dx, we're doing a partial path integral here, right? Because we have made the assumption that the q component is zero in this in this argument. And so what we need to do then is integrate around the boundary, but the boundary, if we go back to our picture, we're going off this type one picture, our boundary kind of has uh, four components here, right? It has a C1, and then it has the C2, which is just vertical, and then C3, and then our C4, which is also vertical. And to go around the boundary, we need to, we need to include all four components, right? And so our path integral, we can break up into the path integral over C1, PDX, plus integral over C2, PDX, plus integral C3, PDX, and then finally integral C4, PDX. All right, let's try to, um, let's try to simplify this as much as we can. Again, we're looking at this picture right here. Our two boundaries are vertical boundaries, C2 and C4. For those boundaries, again, they're vertical, right? And so what's how's X changing along those boundaries? Remember, our path integral is only a partial path integral, and it only cares about DX, right? It's only, only the X is changing in this partial integral. And so along these two vertical segments, DX equals zero. And so the C2 and the C4 portions are gonna be zero. So for these two, C2 and C4, the dx is equal to zero because these are our vertical segments. Okay, so we can get rid of those entirely. And then all we're left with is the integral along C1 of PDX plus the integral along C3 of PDX. And so now we need to write these out and try to understand how they're working. Now, both of these are integrals with respect to only the x component. So what we need to do is replace the y components of each of these. So let's just look at C1 first. C1 is traveling in the proper direction, first of all, from A to B in the x direction. And as it changes, its y value is determined by this function, right, by g1 of x. So we're gonna be able to replace the y and write down some boundaries for the x and write that down as a regular kind of calc one looking integral, calc two maybe. And then up here, the same situation is happening except this one's going from b back to a, okay? So this one's going in the reverse orientation. So let's write these out. So when we make this substitution here, uh, first of all, we want to write, I'll do this in two steps. We wanna remember that our function p is a function of both x and y. Whoops, c3 is the one that's left over here, right? But then, like I said, each of these can be written in terms of what the x is doing, right? And so the first integral, the c1 integral, this is the integral from a to b of p of x, but along the first portion, c1, the y value is determined by g1 of x dx. And so now that's just an integral with respect to x, right? The second 
portion of the curve, which is actually C3, this one, the Y component is given by C2, and this curve is going kind of backwards, right? It's going in the reverse orientation from B to A. So this is then P of X comma G2 of X dx, also an integral just in terms of dx. Um, but what we want to do now, we're almost there, right? We, we, we've got a statement that looks very similar. If we compare with um, what we got for the double integral up here with our path integral down here, these are very, very similar. The only difference is this goes from A to B and it's minus. Well, this one goes from B to A. If you switch if you reverse the limits, you always get a minus sign, right? Because this now has become a calc 1 integral. And so these two are definitely equal to each other. I'll just write this out. So this is integral a to b, p of x comma g1 of x dx, minus the integral in the same direction from a to b of p of x g2 of x dx. Okay? And so what we've shown then is that in this very special case, all right, so when our region D is type 1 and our vector field is given by P comma 0, right, then in this special case we've got double integral over D of minus DP DY with respect to area. This is equal to the path integral around the boundary of P DX. All right, that does not prove the theorem, okay, so what remains to be proved? So I'm going to write RTP, remains to prove, and really this is something that you should do yourself. So FTIS, for the interested student. Um, you should do the same thing here. So you should suppose that D is type 2. D is a type 2 region. And that F is equal to 0, comma Q now. So 0 out the P component. And then show um, that the double integral over D of dq dx da with respect to area that this should be equal to the path integral of q dy all right if once you did one not if but once you've proved this then this will prove green's theorem on our what we've called our simple regions okay so these two taken together so the argument for this second one is is totally analogous and it's a good exercise for you to do it so these two taken together uh, prove the special case of Green's theorem. All right, and we are going to now go ahead and use Green's theorem in more complicated situations um, where this theorem doesn't necessarily prove it, but um, in a later course, hopefully, if you go on in math and continue on, you will prove this theorem in, in a more general case, um, and you'll see the beauty of it once again.